Welcome back to the Beyond the Buckets. Happy to have Coach Mike Motil from St. Francis join the program. Thanks for joining us, Coach. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Coach McSwain. Good deal. Well, uh, let's jump right into it. I would like to know a fun fact about you that uh, people might not know about Coach Motil. Oh, a fun fact about me? Yep. A fun fact. I don't know. Fun fact? Well, it's, you know, for me, it's fun to have four children. Uh, that, that is Three fun. of them are actually current, current students at St. Francis. <laughs> it can be overwhelming at times. Um, but uh, three of my children actually are at St. Francis, which is kind of fun for me. It might not be for them. Yeah. Um, and I also, have a, I also have a seventh grade daughter as well. And uh, so, yeah, it's busy, um, but it is fun. It's fun to, uh, to have all these kids in your house and have such a big family. We're blessed. And uh, yeah, no, it's fun. It'll be, it'll be, I'm not sure if it's going to be fun when they leave because uh, I have a senior daughter. Mm -hmm. not going not sure if it's going to be fun when she leaves. I don't, I'm not sure what the emotion is going to be, but that, that day is coming. So. Sure. But having a big family and having, having four children has really it's been, it's been good for me. It, it happens really. quick. I've got two kids uh, under three. So uh, I just, I just, <laughs> I just know how fast that has kind of gone. So I can imagine how it is with you and, and having four, like you said, it's just truly a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. That sleep deprivation that you're going through right now is, uh, yeah, now you get used to it. So, uh, for sure. I, I feel like pain. I've been there. So I didn't drink coffee before I had them. And, uh, now I drink coffee. I only, I only do one cup because somebody like me, too much caffeine is just not a good mix. So, uh, I usually just have one cup a day. Yeah. Uh, yeah that, the coffee is, uh, it's a, it's a game changer. Yeah, it can be. Definitely. Uh, well, let's get a three minute origin backstory on you. Um, I didn't know that you were from Ohio, which we found out on the pre-call and I've known you for a number of years now. Um, so tell me a yep. three minute backstory on you and uh, how you got to where you're at now. So um, I, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I, I was actually born in, in Würzburg, uh, West Germany, where uh, Nowitzki is actually spent a lot of time. I learned um, my dad was actually in the army there. And uh, then I, we came back to Columbus, um, grew up there. I'm, uh, I'm an Ohio State grad. Um, I went to Ohio State, actually. I, I was trying to decide whether to go to this Division three school in Ohio to play soccer and basketball at Ohio State and go to school. And then I went and tried out for the soccer team at Ohio State, and they redshirted me. Um, but my high school basketball coach called me uh, during my freshman year at Ohio State and asked me if I wanted to come coach basketball. And I was like, sure. So. I've been coaching high school basketball for over 30 years now. Uh, wow. Started in 1988 as a freshman basketball coach at my alma mater and just kind of slowly worked, worked my way through. Um, my wife and I uh, decided in uh, 1998, we moved to California. Um, my wife came out here, she was in high tech. I went and, and found a job teaching Columbia Middle School in Sunnyvale, uh, teaching seventh grade math and um, I asked everybody, where do you go to coach basketball around here and there? You go to St. Francis. So I met with Coach Filios uh, in 1998 and uh, became a volunteer assistant. And my, like I said, my wife was in high tech, so she wasn't ever at home. So I was here at the gym four hours a night, four or five hours a night, working with the JV team and the varsity team. And the, the next year, Coach Filios made me the head JV coach. And three years later, I was offered a teaching job here um, at St. Francis. Spent 15 years here as assistant dean of students, uh, also in the math department, teaching geometry. Yeah. And uh, now I'm in year 13 of being the, the head basketball coach here at St. Francis. And uh, yeah, just blessed. Uh, it's a great place to teach and work. Uh, great community. And just a, a great group of kids that, uh, that want to come and be Lancers. Definitely. Um, you know, so 30 years in coaching, talk to me about some of the ups and downs that you have in coaching and we'll kind of get into some of your winning seasons, but, uh, as coaches, you know, the, the ones that really stick with you are the losses a lot of the times and the, the difficulties that may go along with coaching. And we all have them, no matter what program you're at, no matter what level you're at all the way from grassroots, all the way to the highest levels, WNBA, NBA, um, you know, so tell me a little bit about some of the ups and downs. I can start with the highs and then maybe go to the lows. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, life is full of those, fortunately. You know, I think all the ups and downs and all the 
the mountains we climb like if you don't fall down in the valley you don't get to climb that mountain again right and uh sometimes you find yourself you know you learn a lot when you're down and um you know i, I find those you, and we've been that way we've been up and down we are a you know if there's a roller coaster ride through the wcal it's probably where we've seen the top and we've seen the bottom um and we're blessed to be able to do both of those things i think uh, some of our worst times are some of our greatest learning experiences for sure and uh you know i i we're just, well, I'm, we're just blessed in all that you know we've won the wcal four times um while i've been here and uh the, you know that's a that's a blessing not a lot of schools can say that um you know, two of those times we went undefeated in the league and that hasn't happened since the eighties. Um, Bellerman also did it a few years back for the first time. Yep. Um, so there's lots of, uh, there's lots of blessings in it all. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, appreciative to, to be a Lancer and to, uh, the coach of the school. For sure. Um, uh, you know, you are right. It, it is just like life. There's going to be things that kind of hit you. There's going to be times where everything is jubilant and happy. Uh, but it's the mindset to always fight back no matter what situation you're in. Um, and, you know, I heard this on one of the other podcasts, but there's two types of coaches, the coach getting ready to be humbled and the coach that is humble. Um, and you take me as that type of person, always being humble, always being grateful for the opportunities that you have, um, being where you're at, be, you know, being at a, such a great school like St. Francis. So really appreciate, uh, you know, the, the, the level uh, of, you know, cognitive recognition that takes place when you're at a situation like you're at, because so many people could look at it, you know, winning four times in the WCL and we'll get to that is super, super difficult. But like you mentioned, you're so blessed to even accomplish that, uh, that many times. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, um, we've had a lot of, a lot of good teams here, a lot of good players come through here, both on good teams and bad teams. Um, you know, we really talk to the kids. I talk to my, my kids on the basketball program and sometimes they complain about how tough it is academically here. And, and I just tell them that's the way we want it. Right. That, we want to make college easy for you. And, um, you know, this, this academically, this place is not for everyone, um, but you're going to get challenged. You're going to get challenged uh, both in the classroom and on the basketball court. And, um, you know, whoever wants to come here, that's, that's what's uh, coming their way. And uh, we just work with uh, who wants to be here and who wants to be a Lancer. Absolutely. Uh, you talked about some of those good teams that you had specifically in, in 2009, 2010. I think those were both 31 seasons for you, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then in 16, you had a really great, great squad. Almost everybody on that team ended up playing college basketball at one level or the other. So tell me about what made those teams so special. I know you've had Tyler Johnson and, uh, and, and Noah Stapes and Peter Hewitt and Curtis. The, the list goes on, but what really made those those squads uh, special? I think uh, just being selfless, uh, the willingness to share the basketball, the the willingness to, to share the good and the bad, um, you know, no matter what came. I think uh, kids really did a, you know, them being talented was easy, right? I mean, I didn't do any of that. Um, for me, it's more about how do you get them to get along with each other? How do you get them to... Like I said, take responsibility, collect together as a group, defend as a group, share the ball offensively as a group. Uh, how do you get them to do those things and encourage them? You know, you mentioned Curtis Witt, and, you know, Curtis Witt's still playing basketball at Menlo College, getting ready to go into his senior year. And um, Curtis came off the bench his senior right. um, We By the end of the year, he, he was just – that's the kind of sixth man that you want, a guy that's going to just step in and, and do things uh, offensively with the battle and pick your team up. And, uh, and he didn't complain about it. Um, he came in and, and did, you know, the best that he could, um, you know, and that's actually something that Tyler Johnson did in 2000 and uh, during his, during his senior year, right. In 2010, he, uh, you know, Tyler came off the bench all year. Um, actually one of the only games we lost that year is when we started him. So, um, you know, and Tyler even mentioned, you know, as he plays professionally now um, with the Nets and the Suns and the Heat and wherever else he ends next year, um, he mentions that in some of his interviews, how he's used to coming off the bench that, uh, there are times when he started in the NBA and times where he's coming off the bench and, and reflecting back on his high school experience and how that's helped him uh, coming off the bench when he was in high school. Even his junior year, you know, he spent time coming off the bench because we changed starters in 2009. We, you know, we were rolling five at a time, right? Because we were picking up and, and we were getting lots of people involved and trying to wear people out. And, uh, you know, there were times in, in during his junior year when he uh, 
when he came off the bench. And, you know, the thing about Tyler, uh, and I've, I've coached in programs where two, I've had two players in our programs that have made, uh, that have played uh, in the NBA. Um, and one of those was Antonio Daniels. And uh, when I was back in Ohio at the sales high school, which is where Antonio graduated and where I graduated. And then Antonio went on to Bowling Green. Um, and then Antonio became a lottery pick. Uh, but Antonio was never, was not uh, recruited. Um, Antonio didn't have a scholarship offer until after his senior year. Um, and he ended up going to Bowling Green and playing for Coach Laranega. And uh, same kind of thing happened with Tyler. Tyler was not heavily recruited. Um, Tyler finally started getting some nibbles towards the end of his senior year from, you know, Fresno State and Utah State and uh, ended up going to Fresno State. Um, but, but two of them were just huge gym rats, like couldn't get him out of the gym. You know, when, with Antonio, you know, Tone's only like four or five years younger than me. And so I was a young assistant, you know, laying on the floor, trying to get out of the gym, right? Trying to kick Antonio out of the gym, him and his agent, Colin Bryant, um, were teammates at that time. And I was like, Tone, man, I got to go. You know, I was a college student. I was ready to get out, and, you know, and I'd go to do some stuff, right? Yeah. And, uh, but the same thing with Tyler, right? Like just, they're just, you can't get those, those kids out of the gym. They just want to be there. Um, and uh, just those two, um, it's just, you never know what's going to happen. You never know how these kids are going to develop. Um, you just got to keep them grinding uh, and keep them working. And a lot of that comes from within themselves, right? That there's no quit in some of those kids, so. The ironic thing about that is Tyler was the MVP of the league his senior year and came off the bench. And I believe Curtis was as well, if I'm not mistaken. I don't, I don't know if Curtis was the player of the year. I don't, you know what? We I didn't believe, have the player I believe, of the year. We weren't. We, I, be, I thought he was because Curtis, you guys were undefeated, right? No, we did, but, but we were not given the player of the year, so. Oh, okay. Well, that's another it's story for another day. <laughs> it's interesting. When, when Tyler was the player of the year, there was, we had no one else on first team all league. Wow. When it came out. So got, Tyler was the player of the year. Won came 30 the games. Bench. Nobody else. So, and we won 30 games, both. Yeah. And, and, all, and both of those years, and we didn't have the player, the, we had Tyler was the player of the year in, in 2010. Sean Grant was in 2009 with Jerry Brown. They split it. Um, and we had some great games with Sacred Heart Cathedral that year. Uh, they had Jerry Brown and, and uh, what was Kevin's name? Kevin Green with USC to was a, uh, play football. At, and uh, their point guard, Cooper, I think Daryl Cooper was his name. And I think he went to, to uh, SF City College. And they were, they were good, man. And we had some really good games against them back in 2009. So. Yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, you know what? Um, not having the player of the year in 2016 was – um, I don't know. Yeah, we didn't. We uh, I think Tyler's probably the Tyler and Sean Grant are the only player of the years that we've ever had here. So those wow. two years that we won the league, I don't think we had the player of the year in the league in 15, 16. That 2016 team, I, I coached uh, pretty much all those uh, at one point or another, I coached all those kids in AAU. So I know how difficult the coaching job would be um, to have so many talented players on that roster and uh you know it's a true testament to what you and your staff did to get them over the hump and most people don't know that you were in the championship game the year before and um you know one of the players that we both coached ends up fouling somebody on a three-point um you know if you make that call or not but uh it's a real testament to getting back up after something like that happens a year before and running through the league the following year, winning the championship. Um, I think that's just a, a true testament to the character of those kids and as well as your program. Yeah, no, I, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, they were, they were a fun group to coach. Um, uh, you know, a couple of them are still playing, obviously Noah and Peter are still playing down at Point Loma. Uh, hopefully they have a see the final season. Um, Darius is in Michigan right now. Uh, I think he's still in Michigan. Uh, he just he just left a couple months ago. But I'm not even sure if they had a football if he had a football season or not. Um, but uh, you know, last time I heard Darius is in Michigan, still trying to play football. Um, you know, Logan's at St. Mary's, uh, trying to. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how his junior year there goes. And um, yeah, yeah. Like I said, Curtis is still playing. Uh, Giuseppe's graduated. Actually, I just. I just went golfing with Curtis, Giuseppe, and Noah uh, like last month. Um, the four of us went out golfing 
I don't golf. It's terrible. So it's more just about seeing them and hanging out and talking to them. And, and actually a week before that, I had, I had gone golfing with Tim Wang and Robbie Vaughn and Drew Silver off of the 2009, 2010 teams. So, um, tried to, uh, tried to use this COVID to, you know, get back in touch with some of our players and talk to them and see how they're doing, see how their lives are going. Um, so yeah, just kind of a little side note there. No, it's really about the relationships, and you've obviously done a really good job uh, continuing the relationships with those players, even gone. Um, but for people that don't know, that may be out of the area, what is the West Catholic Athletic League like? I mean, I've, I've been there. This is going to be my eighth season. I'm hoping that we get a season um, as far as being the varsity head coach. Uh, you know, and our our league is is top to bottom, very similar to yours. I mean, we got second place the last two years, and we went. 500 in league um and that just goes to goes to show you like how hard it actually is on a day-to-day night-to-night type of basis um so tell me about the boys wcl well i think uh you know it's a grind you know it's a it's a grind every year um you know, and then when you get through the league, then you get to go to CCS and play WCL schools some more, right? Um, but that's what we enjoy about it, right? I mean, I think all of all of the coaches, um, I think all the kids, that's why they go to the WCL schools, is they want the challenge. Um, they want to go see what it's like to, to play against really good competition night in and night out. Um, and then our job as coaches is, you know, make sure that they get better, uh, make sure that they, you know, take care of their business academically, try to make them better, better basketball players, better people. Um, but the, it's a challenge, right? It's a challenge when you walk in the building and you think you're going to win and, and, and you don't, you know, how are you going to handle that? Um, that's why, you know, going, going undefeated in this league is almost heard of, you know, it's, it's a tough thing to do. Um, but, uh, you know, last year for us, we finished, well, we ended up being the seventh seed. I think we finished fifth in the league. Uh, we ended up playing Reardon in the first game of the season open tournament and, you know, we ended up beating them. And, um, you know, we had four sophomores out there. We had five sophomores out there at some points in the game. Um, so I think we were really looking forward. To year. We're really hopeful that it happens um, this year. And then, and hopefully next year, we just continue to get better. That's the goal. So uh, hopefully it happens. We're really excited here to play in the WCAL this year and to hopefully we can step up and uh, being so young last year, the hope is that we step up and, and, and take the next role and, and move on uh, with it. We've been here before where we played a bunch of sophomores. We did that with Curtis and Peter and Noah um, and Giuseppe. All those guys played a lot of sophomores and, uh, and it worked out pretty well for us uh, when we won league titles their junior and senior year. So can we make that kind of turn next year? You know, we're definitely hopeful that we're going to be more competitive. Um, obviously, no, we know the, the league is really strong and uh, but we're looking forward to the challenge. Um, of being better next year, this coming year, and, and the following year. For sure. Uh, you mentioned it at the beginning of the show. You talked about your family and how important they are to you. Um, how have you been able to manage family and hoops? For those that may not know, you live about an hour and a half, maybe two hours away from, from the school campus. And, you know, what has that been like for, for almost, you know, almost 20 years at St. Francis? Um, you know, going back and forth on a night to night basis sometimes or staying at the school sometimes, you know, tell me about some of those, those really difficult things, managing both of those uh, high priority items. Yeah. So, um, so 18 years ago, we bought a house in Aromas, California. It's in Northern Monterey County. So it's uh it's 60 miles from campus and, uh, so, and I know it so well because my first child was born in 2002 as well, so she was 18. And uh, she was born in October. We moved in in July. So we were there a couple months, you know, before our first child was born. And, uh, and first off, like none of this happens without a super organized and extremely caring wife. So uh, she does a great job of, t- of taking care of us, including me. Um, so um, we're very blessed in that. But uh yeah, I mean, St. Francis was very accommodating. Um, I mean, there's many nights I slept in a training room here. So uh, that was just part of it. Um, 
but uh yeah as your kids get older um you know thank goodness you know one of them's able to drive another one hopefully can drive can start helping helping get people around um but uh but yeah it was tough you know you had you i would leave at five in the morning i you know when we have practice i i get home at nine o'clock at night usually uh because on the way home i'm usually picking up kids soccer practice or basketball practice or whatever you know and st francis made it you know easy for me to do um by allowing you know how to have practices um you know making it convenient so that i could go see my kids at times um even though obviously when we have league games late at night you're not getting done till nine ten o'clock at night usually those nights are the nights i just i would spend a night up in the training room or something like that um and then just get ready for work the next day and kind of go from there so uh yeah it could be tough but um you know, life's not supposed to be easy. You know, we talk to our kids about it. Life's not always easy. Uh, appreciate the, appreciate the grind. Um, appreciate when times are tough, uh, accept it and, uh, you know, find a way, uh, when one door closes, you know, it's your job to go open another door and, and go figure out how to make it happen. Uh, we even talk about that with our athletes here on, you know, when, when we, unfortunately in basketball, you know, you have to cut athletes. And I think the big thing as an educator is I need to make sure we take care of those kids and talk to them and help them open another door. Um, you know, when, when this door closes and, you know, cause lots of kids, they come from schools and they were basketball players and this is it. And this is what they want to do. And all of a sudden it, you know, it ends in high school. And how do you, how do you help those kids? So it's much more than dealing with the kids on your team. You know, there's, there's a lot of kids to take care of in this world. And, you know, it's our job as educators and coaches to do that. Um, and obviously for me, you know, I have four kids and I take care of them and I take care of their friends as much as possible and look out after them. And, you know, they take it, 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 it takes an entire community, right? It takes a, to, you know, I try to take care of the whole village. Right. So, um, you know, it's all of our jobs to help take care of kids these days. Definitely. What motivates you still to this day, 30 years in, uh, to coaching? Why do you keep doing it? Man, I tell you what, so I was, I was on a cl- I was on that clinic this morning, right? And I'm watching, listening to coaches, and it's all good. And then all of a sudden, I get to the coach, and I can't remember which college it was. And he was filming live from his practice. Like I was watching a practice, and I was like, "Oh my!" I was like almost depressed. I'm like, "God, this sucks." I'm sitting here watching these guys practice, like they're getting after each other practicing. And it's like, holy crap, man! I'm just like, like that's I miss that, right? Like all the feet apart, you know? It's like making them do dribbling drills and stuff like that. Right. Well, it's like, for me, it's like, there's just so much more teaching that goes into uh, developing a team, I guess, um, as opposed to just the individual skills of a player that, you know, that I'm, you just, I could think you crave that, um, how tough it is to bring a group together uh, to get them to care about each other. Right. And to get them to go perform at a high level. So um, I think as an educator, I try to do the same thing in my classroom. Uh, you know, it's not about the geometry that I teach. It's not about the basketball that I coach. Uh, it's about the relationships with the kids. Um, and how do you get them to buy into working hard and being a part of something? So uh, I think that's probably why I love it. Great answer. I love it. Um, tell me about some of the struggles that you have as a top level program in the Bay area struggles, no matter what situation we're in, we could be at a school that has very limited resources or a school that has a lot of resources, but everybody's going to find themselves with different struggles, whether it be with administration wise, whether it be with the parents, whether that be with the kids or whether that be just the level of competition that you face. So what are some of the struggles that you've had at St. Francis? Well, I think, I mean, any, I'm not trying to characterize struggles. Like when you're working with teenagers, there's, you know, good times and bad times. Um, you know, being a, being a Dean uh, for 15 years as well on this campus, um, you know, typically the kids that a lot of the kids that got in trouble were the kids that uh, we didn't do a good enough job of empowering to stay on our campus and do something. Right? Um, the kids that would come to school academically and then leave, leave us and go do something else. And, um, you know, so this, I guess the struggle for me is what do we do with kids that all of a sudden they came here with these high hopes and aspirations and all of a sudden, you know, they've, they, they've lost them, right? 
and how we as educators and coaches open other doors. So what I did a couple of years ago is I did a, what's called a, I called it Saturday night lights. Right. And it was kind of a playoff, you know, the, the football stuff. Right. But it is, I did an intramural league here at St. Francis um, mm -hmm. and it was on Saturday nights and uh, we played, we had four games a night. We had so many kids that wanted to come to it and they made this right. Um, and, and all I did was officiate the games. Right. I just, I made the schedule. Um, and it's interesting. I, this was like, right. I, I want to say it was either right before we had kids or right when we just had a couple kids uh, because then it got to the point where I was like, I just can't, you know, I can't do this. And it was something that I wanted to do for kids that love the game, but weren't a part of the program. Um, and there were so many of them. And uh, it was really a unique experience. And we had, you know, we had made for the winners of it. And, um, you know, if I could have just kept rolling with that, I think uh, if time would have permitted, um, you know, how do you get your, my players then in the program involved in that, right? How do you make them coaches or, um, you know, make them the official? and uh just make it just a whole whole nother thing sometimes with facilities and stuff that can be tough we're blessed here at st francis with really nice facilities um so i think the a big struggle for me is how do you get those kids involved um you know those kids that you've cut uh those kids that never tried out because uh you know they just figured they weren't going to be good enough but that still love the game um and want to do stuff I, I think that's something that i struggle with uh maybe the most um but as far as with program you know, most people talk about wins and the losses and the, and the struggles. And, and I don't, I just don't see it as that, right. I see it all as learning experiences. Um, how do we teach humility? Um, how do we teach standing back up when things aren't going your way? Um, all those things are educational. They're all teaching moments. Right. And um, so I, I don't see them as struggles. I see them as opportunities, I think, to, uh, to help kids learn. Right. So. I think it's a great answer. I, I love the fact that you are thinking about kids that might get left behind. And I think, you know, we as as educators, we need to make sure that we're touching all of these kids, not just the kids that we're directly coaching. And so I think that is a great program. I know for me personally, uh, especially with all the, the racial unrest that has kind of gone on uh, over the last eight months um, of just mentoring other kids that might not even be in my program, whether that be young ladies, young men, and to be there for them or go speak on the, uh, at the BSU or, or, or wherever and just opening myself more to these kids that may not see me every day. Because the kids that I coach directly, they get to see me every single day and I have a, you know, I have an impact on their life um, daily. Whereas some of these other kids that are at the school still need that. But, um, you know, that's in my heart. So I really appreciate you talking about the program that uh, that you that you started for the for the kids that may not play um, on that topic. You know, the many of the um, private schools here in the area came under fire, I guess you would say, with, uh, you know, the racial inequalities that have been going on. And, you know, that sparked a whole bunch of things. Um, with regard to all of the communities that we're in, as far as the, the private, the private school system, um, what are your thoughts on on all the all the things that the students may have felt, whether that be directly at St. Francis or just in general? And you know, moving forward, what do you think is the course of action for educators to step in and people that may have had a few bad experiences, but maybe their whole experience wasn't bad, but just getting it to a point where they feel like this was the perfect place for me for the, you know, for my four years of high school. Yeah, we, uh, TJ is knocking on the door there. Coach Pulowski, I think, is letting him in. So, um, yeah, we, uh, you know, as far as reaching out and stuff like that, um, it's interesting. We, we scheduled a game against Christopher High this year. Um, down in Gilroy because a lot of those kids down there I coached when they were little kids so I, I coached NJB down there I've had uh, been fortunate to to coach uh, girls soccer teams uh, down in that area because I have a younger daughter that plays soccer um, so we've been able to to you know go down there in that community and try to do some 
we've done a lot of stuff in Gilroy. There's a large homeless population down in Gilroy that, that our kids, uh, there's a Lord's table down there that we volunteer at and do stuff. Um, just, we do a lot of stuff to try to help with the community here at St. Francis. Um, we've done a lot with social justice, equity, and, and inclusion. Um, actually tonight, all of our coaches are coming onto campus to watch a movie that, uh, that D Wade was part of, uh, of producing, um, in regards to, a, um, a crew team of, of black athletes in, out of Chicago. And, um, we're going to come together tonight as a coaching staff and we're going to watch this movie and we're going to talk about, uh, social justice and, um, and, you know, the types of things that we need to do, uh, to help with the quality. I love it. Um, yeah, I think this this time has opened up a lot of people's eyes and and just furthering further or further educating yourself. I think is the best for you know black people or white people or any any color really to to where somebody is from. And I think that's very important for everybody to do is just educate yourself and ask questions and have tough conversations where it may be a little uncomfortable. But ultimately, as we've been talking about this whole podcast, the uncomfortable situations end up making you mature and grow. And that's really what we're, we're all trying to find is that, that growth and that maturity uh, in all aspects of our life. Um, you've been coaching for a long time. Uh, give me not maybe your five best players, but give me the five players that you have loved to coach the most and the reasons why they were so special. The five players I've loved to coach the most. Hmm. Oh, that's a, that's a good one. Well, uh, that's two. Uh, I'm trying to think back to my days back in Ohio. Um, okay. I think I maybe I can handle this one. Um, I, I talked a little bit about Antonio and Colin earlier, uh, Antonio Daniels and Colin Bryant. And I just love the, you know, the fact with, and with Tyler Johnson, the fact that three of them were just constant workers, um, love the game. I think two guys that are probably under the radar in regards to that, uh, Danny Ackman uh, played alongside David Coyote and Hakeem Gilliard and uh, John Montgomery and uh, David Velasquez uh, back in the day, they were a really, really good team back in the early 2000s. Um, and Danny was just this quiet work hard dude. Just, uh, he played for me as a sophomore when I was a head JV coach. We created the Warrior Award because he was just, he's just nonstop, just nonstop after him. So, and actually it's funny because I just talked to Danny because uh, he just had his child too long ago. But um, yeah, I just always just remember Danny being uh, the unsung hero on a team with a bunch of talented guys that actually are college basketball coaches. You know, David Velasquez is, Associate head coach of San Diego State, John Montgomery's coaching in Hawaii. David Coyote played in Europe uh, for a long time, and uh, so Danny was the hunk, the unsung hero on a on a really good team. So um, just I remember him mostly as a sophomore, just playing really hard and and uh, just being that guy for for our JV team. And and I think Giuseppe too, Giuseppe Benedetti, that just the kid that uh, just did every everything you wanted. Um, you know, from, from a player, from a teammate, uh, from a person in your community. I think Giuseppe, uh, you know, not only a really good basketball player, but just a really good person and uh, a really good teammate to be, to be around. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't mind making a team with those five, those five players. That's good. And the thing about it is all of those players had one thing that was consistent, okay? They were all hard workers. They were all great people. And if you have those two things, you're going to go far in life. You know, just the work ethic, being relentless more than, as you mentioned, AD and, and Tyler would stay in the gym until they got tired. Not when you got tired, but when they got tired. Uh, and then just the, the, the personality that you have to be selfless or selfless, you know, has been selfless. He's been a good friend of mine as well. Um, but I, I seen Giuseppe grow up. Uh, he was selfless because you have to sacrifice for those teams. And I think, you know, that's the one of the biggest things I think will gas our coaches and, and people in general is like everybody has a role on the team. You know, you have a you play a role in your family. 
whether that be picking up the kids or whether that be making dinners or, or whatever the case may be. And each one of those teams that had success all had to play a different position. Some people may have had to come off the bench, had to be the rebounder or, or whatever the case may be. But I think that is so true for this entire conversation. And, and that's why we do call it Beyond the Buckets because we barely talked about basketball today. Um, but you hit on it. It's the relationships that you have. And obviously you have great relationships with your players. So is there anything else you want to leave the people uh, with out there um, that are listening? Nope. You know, Chris, it's, uh, it's been great to you. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, this is actually the first podcast I've ever done. So oh, really? I appreciate you reaching out to me and, uh, and having a conversation and, and now it's time for me to go get in the gym and, and, you know, try to help our players get better. Definitely. Uh, I know you're not a big social media guy, but where can everybody find you or if, if coaches or anybody wants to reach out, where's the best place to do that? Well, I mean, I guess just emailing me at, at Michael Motil at SFHS.com is the best way to, to get a hold of me. Yeah, we do have an Instagram account, but, you know, I'm, I'm over 50 now and that, that technology just gets me. So I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on the whole Instagram thing. So, um, but. Uh, you could have fooled me. I thought you were younger than 50, but I guess if you've been coaching for 30 years. And yeah, no, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm over 50. So, uh, yeah, we'll, just, we'll leave it at over 50. So it's, it's my birthday. <laughs> it's my birthday this weekend. So everybody keeps calling me old man, but uh, I'm, I'm not 40 yet, but I'm itching my way up there. I got two more years until that. But uh, yeah. You look good, kid. <laughs> well, it's a mindset, you know, and you look great as well. And uh, just taking care of yourself as far as coaches are concerned, too. I think that's important as well. You know, we're preaching to athletes to to make sure you eat well and make sure you're exercising and doing all those things. Well, we need to do the same thing, we, um, you know, because I want to live as long as I possibly can. And one way to do that is to make sure that I'm healthy, you know. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think uh, a lot of what we do can be stressful, um, even sitting in a chair too long or sitting on this, uh, you know, on the screen too long, you know, too many video games. And now we're spending so much time ourselves, you know, in front of this video screen. How do we, uh, you know, we got to make sure that we we do we take care of ourselves. I've, I've, in all my years of teaching and coaching, I've never spent so much time seated uh, and I'm really don't care for it all that much, to be honest. <laughs> It's amazing. I got I got my blue light glasses here just in case it's too long. So I, I put these on if I'm on for over an hour or whatnot. Uh, before we let you go, any uh, if we do have a season, well, my, which my, I'm hoping. My, my glasses are so thick. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Uh, if we do have a season, are there any WCAL predictions on the uh, on the men's side? You know, I just, uh, I don't know. I'm going to have to wait till all the transfers break out. So uh, kind of see what happens. Um, I think, uh, I think it's just going to, it's going to be a very competitive league, obviously, you know, um, Midi with their three uh, D1 guys are going to be really good. It's going to be a tough challenge as always. Um, I think Bellerman's going to be sneaky good. And I think people are writing them off and there's no way you can do that. Um, Sarah graduated a lot, so I don't know, you know, I'm not, I don't know a lot of what's coming back, but of course they all obviously always play hard and are well coached by Chuck. Um, I don't know the new coach at SI. I know they lost their point guard, so I'm not sure what to, what to think uh, about SI. Reardon's obviously got a lot of talent coming in um, and a lot of talent coming back, so they should be pretty good. And uh, I know Cathedral got a couple transfer guards that are really good and uh sean being a st francis grad obviously is a great coach and uh and sean and i actually talk all the time and so i think sacred heart's gonna you know they're they're always a tough out man they they got bucket makers and uh, uh that can always be tough and i'm sure mark's uh you know he played some young kids at valley last year so i'm, I'm sure they'll be a year older and a year better for sure. And I'm going to, I plan to try to get every WCAL coach, uh, man and woman on the show. Uh, I've gotten, gotten down the line a little bit, but uh, I think you're the first on the voice. I think Patrick Snyder might be up next. Okay. So that'll be a good one. Um, if there was one guest that, that we should have on the show and before you, 
before you say the name, if you say the name, then you have to make sure you make the connection. So this will be the last one. This is the begging, the begging portion of the show because I'm only as good as my guest, coach. <laughs> so how, so why you reach out to me then? I don't, I don't get that one. I already had Tyler um, on. So I already had Tyler <laughs> on. So you can't you can't say him. You got Tyler on. Uh, yeah, Tyler's usually my go-to with all this. But actually, it's funny because I invited him, and he, of course, he know, Tyler's fifty on texting me back, so he's not real good with that. You just gotta um, go. You gotta go through Jen. She she runs everything. Go through Jen. Maybe you need to have Jen on. You know, that would be a good one. Um, who should you have on? Let me think. Uh, let me think outside the box here. Um, I mean, I mean, Noah would be easy for you to get on, right? Yeah. Um, and Noah's uh, Noah's. He's a good interview. He can talk. Um, For sure. Yeah. Um, He's come over to the backyard a couple of times this summer. So uh, we, get, to, we get to reminisce a little bit. You know, there, there's a San Jose kid that uh, I might be able to, I might be able to get you on with Cyrus. I okay. might be able to get Cyrus on here with you. Okay. Uh, let me see. Let me see if I can work that. And, uh, you know, Cyrus is, Cyrus loves to talk too. And, uh, you know, maybe having a football player on here would be, an interesting perspective uh, for you. Definitely. Well, you we got to make that connection. Him or those two. How about that? All right, I'll see. Um, if, I, if not Cyrus, then I could probably get Bennett. Or you know what? I, I probably can get Evan Williams. You know, for, okay. Evan Williams played basketball here. He's a captain as a sophomore at Fresno State. Um, you know, Evan's a he's a he's a really good guy. Or or we can get Momo. We can get Mo Wilmer too up at Nevada Arena. So and any all right. any and all. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to get some great value from it. All right, Chris, great talking to you. You take care. All right. All right. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Beyond the Buckets podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and share the show with your friends. And until next time, take care.